If you would like to know, our closing will be number 98. Jesus, we just want to thank you. Maybe you heard about the little girl who wanted a kitchen, a kitten, and so she asked her mother for a kitten, but her mother didn't like cats. But she kept asking for a kitten, and finally her mother said, if God wants you to have a kitten, he'll provide a kitten. Oh, she was excited. Finally, her mother not, wasn't saying no. So she went out to the backyard, and she knelt down, and she began to pray, asking God for a kitten. Quoting Matthew 7, she had ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. And before she could finish the verse, a kitten appeared, fell from the sky, landed right in front of her. Wow, she didn't know what to think. She thanked God and, and ran, scooped the kitten in her arms, thanked God for answering the prayer, and ran inside to, to tell her mother. Well, here's the rest of the story. There was a preacher who had a kitten, and the kitten climbed up into a tree, and then it was afraid to come down, and he couldn't climb up the tree to get the kitten down, so he, he threw a rope up in the tree. It wasn't a real big tree, but tall enough, and so he threw the rope up, and then he uh, fastened the other end of the rope to his car, and he figured he'd just start driving, and the tree would kind of bend over, and then he'd get low enough for the cat to, to jump. But before it, the cat could, the kitten could jump, the rope broke. And the cat went flying and landed in this little girl's yard right in front of her. About a week later, the preacher was at the grocery store and he, he noticed his neighbor and she was buying cat food and she, he knew she didn't like cats and so... He was kind of wondering why she was buying cat food. So he went up to, to talk to her and uh, found out that they had a new kitten. <laughs> now, that story sounds a little too good to be true, but we have to remember nothing is impossible with God. <laughs> and that little girl believed, and she prayed, and she prayed. Turn with me to Luke 18, Luke chapter 18. Tonight we come to a, a parable of Jesus, a parable about prayer, praying and not giving up. Now, there's an introduction to this parable, which is kind of interesting because most of the parables of Jesus don't have an introduction. But this one does. It tells us, one, that it is a parable. That's helpful. But two, it tells us the reason why Jesus is telling the parable, which is very helpful. So we get right up front what the parable is going to be about. So Luke 18, verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Have you ever felt like giving up? Giving up because something was too difficult. Giving up because it was hard to learn, hard to do. If you've ever gone through physical therapy, you understand. It can be difficult and you feel like giving up. Especially if you're not seeing any results. Then you just have a lot of pain and not, you're not seeing why. But we should never give up. Have you ever thought about giving up praying because it didn't seem like God was answering your prayers? Bill Butzko applies that desire to give up and with other parts of our lives. He asked, imagine how your life would have been if you had given up learning to walk. For a child, learning to walk is a real task. They have no sense of balance. They have to develop their muscles so they can pull themselves up to a table or chair and remain standing. The child learns to reposition their legs to move them from one place to another. They wobble with each step and they fall many times before learning this new skill. Children do not give up trying to accomplish this task. They are not afraid 
to try repeatedly. As they gain strength and balance, their self-confidence becomes greater and greater. Soon they have mastered the skill of walking, playing an electronic game, learning a musical instrument, or a host of other skills. He says when it comes to praying, children will pay, pray for the impossible, but adults only pray for what they can see or touch. To a child, nothing is impossible, but to an adult, some things are impossible simply because they do not want to exert the effort. Some adults have faith, but only in the things that are visible and not in the things that are invisible. I hope that's not true of us, that we're ready to pray and not give up. And so Jesus teaches this parable in order to teach us to pray because we often feel like giving up when, when the problems around us seem to overwhelm us. You know, we look at the, the condition of our society today. We look at the political, the, the social turmoil, and it just seems overwhelming. I mean, is there an answer? Is there a solution? What can be done? Well, we know one answer. It's God. God is still in control. God has an answer. He hasn't lost any of his power. He's not lost any of his authority. And, and things may still continue to get worse, but God is still there. And so we should, never, we should never give up, but we should continue to pray. Now, do we give up too easily? All right, so here's the parable beginning with verse 2. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about what people thought. Now, when you hear that description of this judge, you got to wonder, how in the world did he get that position? How did he become a judge? Why, why hadn't he already be, been removed? He should have been. You know, you'll remember what the Proverbs uh, say about fearing God. Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. But this guy didn't fear God. In other words, he, he didn't care if his judgments aligned with God's laws. When Jehoshaphat was king, when he became king, he, he established some judges. And before he did, he gave them some instructions. In 2 Chronicles 19, verses 6 and 7, he told them, Consider carefully what you do, because you are not judging for mere mortals, but for the Lord, who is with you whenever you give a verdict. Now let the fear of the Lord be on you. Judge carefully, for with the Lord our God there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. Uh, do what's right because God's watching. <laughs> and God's not going to put up with anything less than impartiality. You know, a, a fear of God is essential for being a good judge. And if this guy had didn't fear God, he didn't fear the, uh, the people, then, then he was basically just a law unto himself. He just did what he wanted to do. He didn't care if it was right or wrong, he just did what he wanted. And they're not much more dangerous than that. And it didn't, if it didn't affect him, he didn't care. Now, that we read that and we just wonder how that could get by. Well, the chances are pretty good this guy wasn't a Jew. Right? If this had been uh, a Jewish court, a Jewish judge, things would have been different. For one, ordinarily, disputes didn't go to the court. They went to the elders of the community. If it did require a court, uh, the court wouldn't have one judge. It would have three judges. Uh, one would be chosen by the plaintiff, one by the defendant, and then one would be appointed independently. Therefore, this judge was probably one that had been appointed by Herod or by the Romans. And so such judges were, uh, were, were not a lot better than the tax collectors. You know, except that they weren't, they weren't Jews, uh, unless, you know, because they were often influenced uh, by a bribe. 
You know, they were easily bribed in order to get people trying to get their, their cases settled. In fact, it was said that, that those judges would pervert justice for, for a piece of meat. So for not much at all. You know, they, they would throw a case. William Barclay commented that, that the people often made fun of these judges and, uh, and, and especially their titles. Now, the title for the judge was, and I won't give you the, probably Aramaic, was, uh, ju- well, I'll, I'll try. It was Dayana Gezeroth. Dayana Gezeroth, which meant judge of prohibitions. But the people would call them Dayana Gezeloth. Instead of Ge- Gezeroth, they called them Gezeloth. So instead of judges of prohibitions, it became judges of robbery. <laughs> Changed one letter, and it became judges of robbery. And so they made fun of the judges, made fun of their titles. And, uh, and so you can see the people didn't have a very good opinion of these judges. It didn't seem like Jesus did either. Verse 3. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. The judge contrasted with the widow. Here was this mean judge and here is this this poor widow. The judge is a picture of power, a picture of authority. Uh, The widow is a picture of powerlessness, helplessness, poverty. In Jewish society, widows and and orphans were considered to be the most defenseless. The Old Testament refers to them as often being oppressed, taken advantage of, being victims of the legal process. And so God, through through the minor prophets, often spoke up for them. Jesus talked about the widows in his day being cheated out of their their land, their homes and property. But God's desire was that the widows and orphans be taken care of. And we don't have time to read every verse on on this subject, so I'm just going to read a a few from the Old Testament. Here's three. Psalm 146, verse 9. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. Isaiah 117. Learn to do right. Seek justice defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. In Zechariah chapter 7, beginning with verse 9, this is what the Lord Almighty said, administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor, do not plot evil against each other. And then from We remember from the book of James, James chapter 1, verse 27, he says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Sound like God cares for the the widows, for the orphans? Yeah, God does. This judge didn't. (laughs) He didn't care. He didn't care what God thought. He didn't care what people thought. John Corson commented on the, on the chances this woman of being heard. He said they didn't look very promising for three reasons. First, she was a woman in that culture. Uh, women were second-class citizens at best. Second, she was a widow, and so she didn't have a husband to help stand up for her. And then third, being a widow, she would have been poor. She wouldn't have had money for the bribe either. If the, women, well, if the widow would have had any resources, she could have paid off the judge. She, she could have gotten the help she wanted, but she didn't, and so she's at this judge's mercy. Now, Jesus never explains the situation. What was it that she needed help with? We don't know. What we do know is that if she had had any other place to turn for help, she would have. There was no other option. This was it. And it's not that she was looking for for retribution. She only wanted justice. She wanted what was right to be done by her. And when the judge turned a a deaf ear, uh, she didn't give up. 
because she didn't have anywhere else to turn. And so she continued pleading for the help she needed. And after how Jesus described the judge, I mean, she didn't have a lot of hope either. But what she did have is persistence. And she went back and went back and continued to go back on a regular basis, maybe even daily, asking the judge for help. And the language, <clears throat> the language Jesus using, uses opens the possibility that she was going to the judge not just at the court, but at his house and in the marketplace, wherever she saw him, she would go up to him and ask him for this help. So it's not just in the courtroom. She's asking in, in front of his family, in front of his colleagues, in front of his friends, in front of strangers. She's pleading in front of others for help. Verses 4 and 5. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Now, even though he wasn't interested in helping her, he eventually gave in and, and did help her. He did do what she asked because she was just wearing him out. He got tired of seeing her every day, everywhere he went. There she is. Oh, you know, then she, he tries to run off, but no, she catches up and asks him again. Jesus says he was even, he was even fearful for his own well-being. He was wondering if she might attack him. I have a hard time picturing that one. But that's what the judge thought. And the Greek word there means to, uh, to beat someone black and blue or to blacken their eyes. <laughs> Again, I, I, don't pic I have a hard time picturing this widow giving the, this guy a beating like that, but, but he was concerned. Maybe she had a family member that could have done it for her. I, I don't know. But her persistence paid off. You know, the parable is not that... That different from the one about the man who went to his neighbor at night. You remember the story about midnight, a, a, a visitor comes, a friend comes in, and, and it's at night, he doesn't have any food, and so he goes to a neighbor in the middle of the night, banging on the door, asking for some food, and the guy doesn't want to get up from bed to give him the food, but he eventually does and grants this request because of his persistence. So Jesus is teaching us to continue to pray and not give up. Verse 6. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you. He will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, the parable of the, the unrighteous judge and this widow teach us this one point. The, the point is not to teach us about uh, a woman, it's not to teach us about the nature of God. The single point is to teach us about prayer. If this unrighteous, secular judge will, will finally hear this widow's appeals, how much more will our Heavenly Father who loves us and care for us answer our prayers? And if we say, Father, help, he will hear. And so we believe and continue to pray because we know that God is on our side. And, and things may get difficult, there will always be corrupt people, corrupt governments. What should we do? We should pray. We should pray and not give up. Or, or as the King James put this verse, we should pray and not faint. We should continue to pray and not faint. Now, Jesus is not saying that God is like this judge. 
Jesus is contrasting God with this judge. Jesus is saying that, isn't it saying that if we beg long enough, we can, we can twist God's arm and get him to do what we want when he doesn't want to do it. That, that's not what God is saying, or what Jesus is saying about God. What Jesus is saying is that if this man, who, who doesn't care anything about doing what's right, will eventually do what's right, how much more will God, who loves righteousness, do what is right? And so we shouldn't give up. We should continue to pray. We should continue to seek God's help. Gary Hamrick contrasts the righteous widow to the judge and the judge uh, to our prayers to God. All right, so here's what he says. The widow appealed to a cold-hearted judge. She approached a court of law. She received justice. But we as believers approach a warm-hearted father. We approach a throne of grace. And we receive mercy. And so how much more should we be persistent in our prayers? Maybe you remember the poem by uh, Sam Walter Foss about some men talking about the proper posture when uh, you should take when praying. I, I'm pretty sure I've, I've shared this one before. The proper way for a man to pray, said Deacon Lemuel Keys, and the only proper attitude is down upon his knees. No, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched arms and wrapped and upturned eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Elder Snow, such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast closed and head contritely bowed. It seems to me his hands should be a sturely cl clasped in front with both thumbs pointing toward the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Last year I fell in Hodgkin's well head first, says Cyrus Brown, with both my heels a-sticking up and my head a-pointing down. And I made a prayer right then and there, best prayer I ever said. The prayingest prayer I ever prayed, a standing on my head. So I guess the best praying is standing on your head. Is that the lesson we should learn? The, the position we take doesn't matter. What matters, and the point that Jesus is saying, is that we're to pray and we're to keep on praying and not become discouraged when our prayers are not immediately answered. You know, David is an example of this kind of praying. You know, in our study of the Psalms, we, we see over and over again David in trouble. You know, how often can David get in trouble? Well, I don't know. We got a lot of Psalms of him asking for help. Right? Every time he faced difficulty or danger, his reaction was to pray. Psalm 55, verses 16 and 17, David prayed, As for me, I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Now, David never gave up believing that God heard his prayers, and that he would help. And so he continued uh, to pray. Now, does that mean that we will always get what we are asking for? No. <laughs> no. We don't always get what we ask from God. You know, sometimes we don't get what we ask from God because it's not in God's will for us. Yet we know that just because we want something doesn't mean we need it. We, we tend to want things that, uh, that support, spoil our flesh, but Jesus, God wants things that, that help us spiritually. There's a new movie coming out, a new Disney movie that's coming out the end of November. Uh, 
I haven't seen it yet. It's not out. But the reviews are already out, which I think is kind of interesting. Almost two months before it comes out, the reviews are already, already starting to come out. The name of the movie is Wish. And it's about this, this young girl who is, gets an uh, apprenticeship for, with a king. And this king has the ability to grant wishes. So everybody in his kingdom submits their wishes to him, and he grants wishes. And as his apprentice, she soon discovers that he doesn't grant every wish. In fact, the, the king says he grants very few of the wishes. And she's not very happy with that. She yells at the king and, and tells him that the people deserve more. And she yells back that he decides, you know, who receives what wishes. He, desire, he decides what the people deserve. Now, I'm not sure what the message is that they're, they're trying to send. Some are suggesting that the king is supposed to represent God. So, uh, I don't know where they get that, but that's what they're saying. All right, so, if, if it represents God, then what they're saying is that God has the ability to do, to grant our requests and yet he doesn't always grant our requests it's not fair why doesn't he grant our requests but can you imagine a world where god grants all of our requests uh, come uh, in a couple of months i'm gonna start praying for snow and charlie's gonna start praying for 70 degree weather <laughs> yeah sounds good he can't grant both of them, right? Uh, what, God, God doesn't grant all our requests. As one person said, if, if God were to grant every one of our prayers, it would be hell on earth. I mean, it, it doesn't work that way. And so we don't always get what we want because it's not in his will. What we ask for isn't always in his will. Sometimes we don't get what we ask for because it's not in his timing. We may be asking for the right thing, but just at the wrong time. Think about Moses. Moses was called by God to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. I mean, you read how God spared his life and provided for him after he was born. God's hand was on him. But you remember what happened when he was 40 years old. He, he saw a, a fellow Israelite getting beaten up by a, an Egyptian guard, and he went out to deliver him and killed the guard and then had to run away, flee, flee Egypt. It, God was calling him, but it was the wrong time. We may, we may want it, it's just not the right time. Think about Paul's life. Paul experienced Jesus on the road to Damascus. God's hand was on him. But it was 10 years before he was involved in ministry. 10 years before he led someone to Jesus. I mean, he already knew the, the scriptures. He knew the scriptures as, anyone, as well as anyone else, but it wasn't the right time. But when the time was right, look what, what God was able to do through him. Sometimes God says yes to our prayers, but it's just not, not right now. Sometimes we don't get what we want because it's just not what's best for us because God has something better for us. Think about the story of Lazarus. Jesus received word that Lazarus was sick. And what did Jesus do? Nothing. He did nothing. Nothing. He didn't decide to go see Lazarus till Lazarus was dead. He could easily have healed Lazarus. But what kind of story would that have been? He had a better story for him. Jesus didn't just heal me. I was dead. He raised me from the dead. And... and and part of the reason why the, the religious leaders were so intent on getting Jesus killed as quickly as they did because they got tired of hearing stories like that. They, they started to hear, Lazarus, we got to get rid of both of them now. Sometimes Jesus, uh, God tells us no because he has something, something better for us. 
Now, Jesus ends the application of this parable with this penetrating question. He asks, when, when I return, will I find anyone faithful? Anyone still praying? Now, we need to remember this story follows chapter 18. It follows chapter 17. Into chapter 17, Jesus has been asked about the coming of the kingdom. And so Jesus is telling about the difficulties that are going to come before he returns. Jesus said difficulties would accompany those days. He told his disciples that they would long to see his day. What do we need to do to make it through difficult times? We need God. We need prayer. We need persistent prayer. Because when Jesus returns, how many will he find who still have faith? It's so disheartening to hear of people leaving their faith. Giving up their faith. I mean, I hear stories, not every day, but it's too often. People turning away. And Jesus says that's what's going to happen. And so we ask, when he returns, how many will he find who still have faith? And it's not just... Will he find people who believe in him? But will he find people whose faith has not given up, who are still standing for what is right, who are still praying? So what do we do when we're faced with difficulties that seem so overwhelming that there doesn't seem to be an answer? We just wring our hands, well, there's just nothing to do. Or do we pray? Are we persistent in our prayers? When Jesus returns, will he find us praying? Jesus told this prayer so that his followers would understand that they need to pray and not give up. Not faint. Continue praying. Because God hears our prayers. God is a God of power. God has a plan. And like the widow, where else are we going to go? There's not another answer. <laughs> and so we keep going to God because we trust him. We trust his plan and that he will do what he has promised. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this example that we see in this widow in this story that Jesus told. Lord, like the widow, we understand that we only have one source for help. Hers which was that judge, but ours is with you. Lord, we trust you. Because we do believe that you are righteous, that you always do what is right. We believe that you are a God of love, and so, Lord, we come to you. Trusting in your plan, looking for that day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.